Hi, welcome back to Autonomous Mobile Robots. My name is Paul Fergale, and I'll be your teacher for this segment. Now, up to this point, we developed some mathematical tools for dealing with an individual wheel attached to a robot base. In this segment, we will extend this theory by stacking the equations from multiple wheels and using those stacked equations to characterize the motion capabilities of a particular wheeled mobile robot. So let's start with some review. Recall from a previous segment, we saw that you could take the general wheel equation, and given the configuration of a specific wheel, you could come up with these two equations, the, the rolling constraint and the no sliding constraint. And we said that uh, for specific wheels, we would call these component matrices J1 and C1. And both of these are a function of beta. Beta, in this case, is the steering angle of the wheel. So if you have a steerable wheel, beta can change. Now, given a wheeled robot, each wheel imposes n constraints, but only fixed and steerable standard wheels impose no sliding constraints. So in this segment, we want to look at, suppose a robot has n wheels, uh, and each wheel indexed by i has a radius ri, then the individual wheel constraints can be concatenated into matrix form. So here we just take all those J matrices and stack them up into this J1. We take all those C matrices and stack them up into C1. And we come up with the sort of stacked rolling constraint and the stacked no sliding constraint. And we've separated these components into two types. So first we have the types for non-steerable wheels. Those are these uh, F matrices. And then we have the um, components for steerable wheels. Those are these S matrices that are functions of beta. And finally, we've just stacked up all the uh, wheel radii and the wheel speeds into uh, J2, uh, a sort of square diagonal matrix, and phi dot, this stacked column of wheel speeds. Now, stacking the rolling and no sliding constraints gives us an expression for the differential kinematics. So you can see that uh, on one side you have all the stacked equations. This is uh, rotating the uh, robot's velocity expressed in the inertial frame into the robot frame. And on the other side you have the wheel speeds. Now if you solve this equation for xi dot i, that yields the forward differential kinematics, uh, which you need for computing wheel odometry. And then if you solve this equation for phi i, that yields the inverse differential kinematics equation that you need for control. Now the maneuverability of a robot is measured by different metrics. Um, and I'll go through those now. So the first one we have uh, mobility. Uh, so that measures how the robot is restricted by no sliding constraints. And secondly, you have steerability which measures the additional degrees of freedom that are uh, given to the robot by the steering mechanisms. So to avoid any lateral slip, we know that the motion of the robot needs to satisfy this no sliding constraint. Um, and if you look at what that means, it means that this component of the equation has to live in the null space of this C1 matrix. So to review, the null space of C1 is the set of all vectors n such that C1n equals 0. And intuitively, this just means that all the axes associated with the no-slip constraints uh, from standard wheels converge at a single point, and that's the instantaneous center of rotation. So the larger the rank of C1, the more constrained a robot's mobility will be. Uh, and so we actually define this metric, the degree of mobility, that's this delta lowercase m, as the dimension of the null space of C1. And said another way, we can just do 3 minus the rank of C1. Now for a robot with no standard wheels, the degree of mobility is always 3. And for a robot with all directions constrained, if you've accidentally put your wheels in a way that no motion is possible, the degree of mobility is then 0. Now for any robot with the degree of mobility 2, the instantaneous center of rotation is constrained to lie on a line. And here are two examples of that. So the Ackerman steered vehicle, like a standard car, you can see all of these no-slip, no-sliding constraints 
converge at a single point, which is the instantaneous center of rotation. And the same thing with a bicycle. They all converge here. And for both of these, because the back wheel is fixed, these back wheels are fixed, the instantaneous center of rotation will always lie somewhere along this line, or this line in the case of the bicycle. Now the degree of steerability represents an indirect, indirect degree of motion uh, for the platform. And this means that uh, the particular orientation at any instant imposes a kinematic constraint, but we can change this by turning the wheels. So we define this degree of steerability, that's this delta S, as the rank of C1. And this is always going to be between 0 and 2. So note that this is not uh, a measure of how many steerable wheels you, are, you, you have. So for the Ackerman steered vehicle, this is sort of always constrained that these guys uh, all meet. And so the steering of these two wheels is actually coupled. So this one has a degree of steerability, 1. Whereas the two steer, these wheels can rotate independently, and this has a degree of steerability, 2. Now the degree of maneuverability combines these two metrics. So it's literally just the sum, the degree of mobility plus the degree of steerability, and that is the degree of maneuverability. And we have some examples on the bottom, like the omnidirectional robot with three spherical wheels, uh, has a degree of maneuverability three, and so on for uh, common robot configurations. Note that two robots with the same degree of maneuverability may not be equivalent instantaneously. And I'll just show that with a quick example here. So here's an example where a robot moves along the x-axis, then it moves, uh, then it changes its orientation, and finally it moves along the y-axis. And so if you have this robot, which is an omni-drive example, so it has three Swedish wheels attached in a triangular configuration. It's a holonomic robot, and it's truly instantaneously able to do these sets of motions. So first it um, does the x direction, then it does, then it turns, and then it moves in the y direction. And this, of course, has a degree of maneuverability, three. Now, if you take a different robot that's still able to do these motions and still has this degree of maneuverability, three, you can see that the, the situation uh, in, the, in the time axis is different. So it is able to move in the x direction, then move in the theta direction, then move in the y direction, so to follow this trajectory. But because in order to do this, it has to turn the wheels, so that's where it gets this extra degree of freedom from the uh, degree of steerability. And so what happens is it has to translate along the x direction, then it has to turn its wheels, then it can rotate, then it turns its wheels again, and then it can move in the y direction. So what we saw in this segment was that stacking the individual wheel constraints gives you an equation that may be manipulated to derive the forward and inverse differential kinematics equations for a wheeled mobile robot. Uh, and secondly, we analyzed the component parts of this equation, that, and that let us um, characterize the types of motions that individual uh, particular platforms are capable of. And to characterize this, we talked about the degree of maneuverability, which was a combination of the degree of mobility and the degree of steerability. Great. Thanks for your attention.